Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to talk about how to get ready for the big day or the big game. Stay tuned. Before we get started, let me give you a brief update. I just did a really cool podcast where I was interviewed, one of my longtime friends, and it was a great interview. We talked about almost everything but being a chef. It's coming out soon. I think you all will really enjoy it, and I will make sure I put it up on all my social media channels when it's available, because I'd love for you all to listen to it. You get to know me a little bit differently outside of being chef from Chef's PSA. So that was pretty fun, going and having a conversational style interview. And we really talked about everything from getting beat up to aliens. Anyway, it was a fun conversation. So I'm looking forward to that. I'll be sharing it here pretty soon. If you want to support the show, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button, like this video. If you're listening on Spotify, make sure you leave five stars. Nothing less than five stars. Because anything less than five stars would make you a terrible person. And you're not terrible people because you listen to Chef's PSA. So clearly you're good people. Five stars. Go to chefspsa.com. You can get all the books and all the merch. And I often get asked which one is my favorite book. And they're, they're all different because every single book I wrote for you at a different stage in your career. Early on, the Line Cook Survival Manual is probably the best one if you're a new line cook. When you're growing into sous chef, that's bad sous, good chef. When you're a new leader, culinary leadership fundamentals. And if you like playing culinary chess and thinking strategically, Kitchen Art of War. I'm still working on Bad Cooks Everywhere. That one will be out soon. I've just had a lot of projects going on and I haven't been able to wrap that one up. I also just recently released the audio version of the 50 Most Important Chefs PSAs. You could go find that. And of course, I also put out a GPT for food cost. I'll link it in the show notes. It's called Food Cost Oracle. So if you're a premium subscriber on OpenAI, you could go get that. It'll help coach you and maybe work through some food cost issues that you may have as a chef. Anyway, let's get on with the show. It being Super Bowl Sunday, which is today when I'm going to release this podcast, got me thinking because I know Valentine's Day is just a couple of days away. And I started reminiscing about all the years as a chef and all the different special events that we'd go through. The big day. And the big day is different for everybody. If you're in Las Vegas, you might be gearing up for the Super Bowl. And I'm sure it's busy. Now, a few years ago, I hosted the Super Bowl in Dallas and I was the executive chef. And I could tell you during Super Bowl time or any of these, big event. So being a chef in Dallas, we were hosting the Super Bowl and we probably had about a hundred small little banquets going on at the same time. Private party pop-ups at all hours of the night. Everyone is a VIP. Money's no object. Everyone's flexing. And I've never worked so hard. At the hotel I was the chef at, at that time, I had to check in a few days before Super Bowl and I stayed in the hotel because I just knew I was only going to get about one or two hours of sleep and then check out after Super Bowl was done. And I just remember thinking, boy, there was, I don't know, 100 BEOs with 100 small parties and you know caviar reception over here, chicken wing lounge over there, VIP over here, tasting menu over there. It was just chaos. We didn't have enough staff, of course. And no matter how much you think you're prepared for it, you never really are. Now, if you're in Vegas right now, shout out to all the chefs in Las Vegas right now that are doing all the pop-ups and the private parties and the after parties. It's chaos. It's outside of what you normally do. You go to work, you're set for dinner, service, lunch, breakfast, whatever the case may be. But during these big events, there's no way you could prepare. You have no idea what's coming. And everything is usually off the menu, special requests. It's not the things that you're used to doing. A lot of times it's set up in locations that you're not used to working. You're working off site. You're in the owner suite, whatever. And there's constant challenges. Not only that, but there's constant changes. The menu's in flux. People are throwing new things at you. You never do ice carvings. They want an ice carving with a caviar bar that's thrown in together last minute. And can you make it happen? Expectations are high and you have to be nimble as a chef and as a cook because you're going to work a ton of hours and you know that going into it. In Austin in particular, as a chef, we would face South by Southwest, which was also very similar or F1 or these other big citywide buyouts. You know, restaurants are closing down every single day and doing buyouts for a different group every single night. They're buying out the entire restaurant. It's a good opportunity for chefs and restaurants to make a lot of money because everyone's fighting to get into the best spots. And let's just say you're the hottest restaurant in town. Well, if the festival's going on for a week, 
you could pretty much charge whatever you want because everyone wants to get into your restaurant and buy it out for the week. People are smart. They know what the hot restaurants are. And everyone's fighting to get that clout and say, we own that restaurant for the night. So it's a great opportunity for chefs and restaurants to make money, but it's also a challenge because of those special menus. Now, on top of special events like the Super Bowl or South by Southwest or F1 or whatever the case may be, you also have special days like Valentine's Day, New Year's Eve, maybe it's Christmas where you're at or Christmas Eve, Seven Fishes Dinner, whatever the case, you're going to face something that you're not used to doing. Because you normally serve an a la carte menu in most restaurants. And then there's these special days where all of a sudden, a couple of times a year, you turn into a completely different restaurant where you serve a tasting menu and your chefs get ambitious because it's New Year's or it's Valentine's Day. So you start to think, well, what would I do if I was in a tasting menu only restaurant? And you don't have time to really plan it out. So you start to put these ambitious dinners together, ambitious menus with ambitious ingredients that cost an arm and a leg that you're not used to spending money on, with a team that's not used to cooking that food, and a service team that's not used to executing a tasting menu style dinner. And then of course, it's amateur night. The people that never go out to eat, they're going out for Valentine's Day and New Year's Eve because that's the one time that they go out all year. And so you kind of got to write a safe menu, right? Strawberries and chocolate, steak and potatoes, but you also got to write a creative menu and you also want to elevate it. It's all these different things that are going on at once because there is a sweet spot for the menu to be creative, but also be able to pull it off and also have dishes and techniques that your team is familiar with. And you're not going to overwhelm the service team because they're not used to doing tasting menu all the time and resetting plates and marking the tables with cutlery after every course. And maybe you work in the type of restaurant that doesn't fire its food. And now you're back to firing orders. Oh, and you threw in an intermezzo just for fun's sake. And you never do sorbet. You didn't even think that through. And only one person knows how to make a nice canal with a hot spoon. You've got yourself in some trouble. And then don't forget about the wine pairings. You never even sell a bottle of wine, but for some reason, everything is paired with a different wine. Did you factor that into your timing? Something to think about. These are the challenges. Then, of course, there's the big holiday brunches. You know, if you work in a hotel or a country club, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The Easter, Mother's Day, Thanksgiving. Sometimes Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, you do these massive brunches. You're going to serve 500 people. They're all going to come through. You have the carving stations. You have your prime rib and your Wellingtons. You have the raw seafood bar. You got the ice carving. 500 people are coming in all dressed up right after church, and you're going to get hit. The omelet station that you never do looks like a mess. You don't have enough cooks to go around, so you might have some temporary workers or contract labor to pick up the slack who don't know what they're doing. You don't have enough dishwashers. Everyone's tired because you stayed super late and you had to come in early the next day to fire the turkey or the roast or whatever the case may be. These days are extremely difficult for chefs because they are the anomaly. They're not what you do day to day. And so how should you plan? I'll tell you what I do. It starts in the menu planning process. The first thing I do if I'm taking over a place as the chef is I try to write the menus for the entire year just so it's done. So I'll write everything from Valentine's Day to New Year's Eve and everything in between. Just get it done for the year so we're not scrambling at the last minute to write menus. Now, what I I will do is as we get closer to those events, I'll pull the menus out and I might do a little refresh, but it's probably minimal tweaks based on things that I've learned throughout the year at that operation. But it's done. I don't have to think about it. It's not stressful. The second thing I do is I try not to introduce too many things that the team is not used to cooking. We might just add a little bit more polish or a little bit more finesse, but I want to do things that they're used to. I also don't want to do things that we don't typically sell because if you're buying a whole bunch of product that you don't typically sell, you might be stuck with it afterwards. And then what are you going to do with it? So I try to write the menu based on ingredients that I know I already have on property. We use in the kitchen day to day and keep the things that we need to bring in that are new to a minimum if possible. Some things that you want to look out for on these big days is not having enough staff. A lot of places have what's called blackout dates where everyone knows at the beginning of the year, these are the dates that you cannot take time off. So it's, you're upfront with everyone saying, hey, everyone's going to be here Valentine's Day. Everyone's got to be here New Year's Eve or during Super Bowl week or during South by Southwest because inevitably people want to take time off. And if you're not paying close attention to these dates, if you don't have your calendar marked out for the year, on what those blackout dates are, you might unknowingly as the chef start approving time off 
during your busiest time of year because you weren't putting two and two together. So I'm up front with people when they start working for me and say, hey, these are the blackout dates. Vacations cannot be taken during this time. It's all hands on deck. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rule, but that's at your discretion to determine what best suits your operation. But in most cases, it's all hands on deck. This is prime time, game time. Get ready. It's the Super Bowl for chefs. The other thing is don't underestimate the amount of people that you're going to need. Remember, you're doing things that you don't do every day. And sometimes it's easier. You get there and it's like, you know what? It's kind of easy. We didn't need that many people. You could make cuts. But other times you think you could do it and you say, well, how hard could it be to do this? We always do 150 covers. Yeah, but you don't always do 150 covers at a seven course tasting or a six course tasting or a five course tasting. It's usually a la carte. And now this is a completely different style of service and maybe the plating is different. Speaking of plating, did you count your plates? Because that seems to be one thing that people overlook sometimes when they're getting ready for these special events is they forget to make sure that they have a plate for every course that's coming up and then they run out of plates or they run out of silverware. So it's important if you need to rent silverware or if you need to rent some plates or if you need to change what plate that dish is going on, you want to think about that before the big day. If you're doing a buffet style, do you have enough equipment? Are you doing chafing dishes and pots and things like that? Do you have enough of those? Do you have enough utensils? Did you map out the flow of service? Because sometimes on these special dates, it's not the normal flow of service. So maybe people come in the kitchen and exit a different place. Maybe they're picking up food somewhere where they don't normally pick it up. Maybe it's a buffet and you have action stations that are placed in different parts of the room. You got to think these things through. The other thing is to think about the timing. If you're setting up a buffet, what time does food need to be ready? What time are you going to walk the room and make sure everything is set? And then, of course, you have to write very detailed prep lists. As I like to say on Chef's PSA, the three rules of catering. Number one, count everything. Number two, count everything. Number three, count everything. Make sure you have a formula for how much you need of everything. It's not always going to be perfect. But I promise you, having some sort of formula and some sort of estimate is better than having no estimate and just guessing. Count your plates. Count your portions, count how many pieces of ravioli you're making, count how many pieces of asparagus are going on the plate, count the mushrooms. Know exactly how much sauce you're going to make, exactly how much soup you need, exactly how many turkeys you need to fire, exactly how many portions come out of a turkey. Make sure you have prep lists and everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do to make sure this is a successful event. Make sure you're following up and making sure that they're actually doing what you told them to do. Then be prepared for the chaos and for things to go south. And keep your cool because if you panic, everyone else panics. Think about worst case scenarios and what would happen. What's your mitigation plan if you were out of Turkey? I could tell you years ago, I was doing a Thanksgiving buffet. This is like, I don't know, about 15 years ago. And about midway through the Thanksgiving buffet, we ran out of Turkey. It's like, there's one thing you cannot run out of on Thanksgiving and that's Turkey. And it was like, hit the panic button, call every single grocery store, call in every favor to get Turkey. Uh, I don't, I honestly don't remember how we did it, but we didn't run out of Turkey because I deployed like three different chefs to different restaurants to go borrow Turkey and call in favors. You only have to make these mistakes one time. And so what do they say? Wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. So learn from my mistake. Make sure you have an exact count of how many portions you're getting out of your big protein items. And if you know there's a potential for disaster, what's your plan B? Don't try and figure out plan B on the spot. In advance, strategically plan out what the potential pitfalls may be and know what you're going to do. Now, once you've done this big event and maybe it was successful and maybe it wasn't, an important thing to do is make sure that you regroup at the end of it, a debrief, what went well, what didn't go well. I always used to run a P&L after big events to see if we made money on them or not, to see what we could do differently, see how we could make more money next time. And you have a good history moving forward. So if you document your history, next year, a lot happens between events and you may forget some of the pitfalls. So if you, if you have a recap, what went well, what didn't, and it's documented, it's always good as you're leading up to the event the next year, what went wrong and you go back, oh yeah, I forgot. This is going to be the plan. So this doesn't happen this time around. Or you're leaving that for the next team that comes in after you. Maybe you're planning on leaving and someone's going to take the reins of the kitchen. You're setting them up for success. Now, you might not want to set them up for success, but you should. It's the professional thing to do. Set the next chef coming in for, after you up for success. With all that being said, shout out to all the chefs that are working hard for those big events, those big holidays. Let's have a great Super Bowl service and let's have a great Valentine's Day special day for everyone. Thank you all very much. If you want to support the show, 
Go to chefspsa.com. You get all the merch, all the books. Go get culinary leadership fundamentals. If you're an aspiring leader, go get Bad Sue, Good Chef. If you're a new sous chef, and go get the Line Cook Survival Manual if you're a new line cook. And get this happy cook hat if you're a happy cook like me. We'll see you next week. Hit the porno music.